You honour me all very much by coming. Thank you very much indeed. Book launches are always the subject of many thanks. Three immediately. To Dr. Valerie Shrimplin, academic registrar, for sitting through 24 of my lectures and tolerating all my difficulties. She then suggested I had the lectures published and referred me to Neil Tipman, and he put me in the hands of Hannah Bowen, an editor, a bit like Mr. Barnier, I should think. We agreed on most things, and whenever we didn't, she was right, and I gave in. <laughs> she was an immaculate editor. I am immensely grateful to all three of them. The book is largely the lectures, but it is in part autobiographical. And so the question arises, what sort of a lawyer may I be? Well, I'm certainly not one of the very clever ones who go to the Court of Appeal and the Supreme Court, and genuinely clever, much to be admired, and deal with the most intricate and difficult problems facing a modern society. Not of them. N nor am I one of the uh, barristers or solicitors of equal intellectual calibre, such as our first speaker, Tim Dutton, who choose instead to stay at the bar to organise and, not to about organise, to press the law through advocacy, and in Tim's case, by the way, to mount every pinnacle of the bar, running the bar, and running a most successful and famous set of chambers, I suppose a bit like a small FTSE 250. So I'm not that sort of barrister either. And I looked up the words that describe people who try to do too many things, and they're either far too offensive or far too flattering. So what am I? I guess I'm a sort of travel guide. And I've tried to take people in the lectures and in the book to places of the law, legal systems, which might be unfamiliar and where I might be able to give some guidance as to what they might be able to find. And that shapes this evening's event. You're going to hear just a little bit more from me, then seven minutes each from my three speakers, to whom I'll introduce you in a second, a bit more from me, and then some questions. Short questions. <laughs> but I thought that it would be helpful if I got my speakers to tell you about the three or three of the landscapes of the law on which I have operated. The first, the ordinary, not ordinary, but the English common law bar, where I worked in both criminal and civil work, but a large amount of criminal cases, from 1971 and until 1998. Tim Dutton, I hope, we'll be able to deal with some of that and give you something of a picture. He came to the bar eight years after I did. We were in the same chambers for a time. And indeed, he was the first person I ever led in a case. We were both juniors at the time. It was a criminal case. And it had the feel, for those of you old enough to remember, and it had the feel of Rumpel. <laughs> no, really. Rumpel with the laughs, with the comments on the good bits of the law and the bad bits of the law, and with all the humanity that he always feeds into those wonderful episodes. I can't remember a case I've enjoyed more than the case I enjoyed leading Tim, but despite the fact that we had such fun, I don't think our client suffered at all. That was probably down to Tim. The second landscape is the landscape I went to in 1998 and stayed at more or less, until 2006. To help you with that is Dr. Navenka Tromp, Nana Tromp, who joined that same landscape, but not as a lawyer. She was, and is, an academic at the University of Amsterdam. And so she and I, but from different disciplines, were finding ourselves on a new landscape, a different landscape. And I hope in her seven minutes, she will be able to give you some reliable account of that. 
The third landscape is a rather different one. It's the landscape of Jersey, where I was only present for a short period of time. And as many of you will know from the lectures or from other places, it was a landscape which brought trouble to me. After the case I was there to try as a judge in 2007, there was an appeal to the ultimate appeal court, the Privy Council. And they clearly formed the view that I was not Judge Jeffrey Nice, but Judge Jeffreys. <laughs> Nasty. And they thought that I had it in for the defendant, and they were completely and totally wrong on every count. So I did that which is not really expected of an English barrister, or indeed of anybody from the English assumed middle class, which is when you're thrashed like the lad in another country, thrashed and thrashed unfairly, you turn around and shake the hand and say thank you very much. No, not my disposition. So I challenged the judgment, which was clearly going to destroy me or damage me. It caused a great deal of damage, and I made absolutely no headway. The judges were determined that they were right, and if they weren't right, they had a number of procedural defences to put up in their own defence. They refused to hear me. They refused to discuss the case. When the case of the man who sought the appeal was over, he got a retrial and pleaded guilty. Well, that's a bit strange. Um, when it was over, there was then no chance of his going back to the Privy Council, and therefore he wouldn't be prejudiced by anything else that I might do. So I wrote to the one person who might be able to provide an objective view of the case and to say whether I was, in fact, off my rocker or whether I might be right. And that was the counsel for the co-defendant who'd been acquitted of the case, not by me, but by the jurats, their semi-professional jurors. That's Catriona Fogarty, the last person from whom you will hear before you come back to me. She immediately wrote a letter knowing it was going to the Privy Council judges, heedless of her own career and the risks it might bring her, and absolutely straightforward and honest in uh, what she had observed of that trial. And that letter is a letter you can read in what's called Appendix B of the book. Many other things happened that slowly moved the needle that was against me, um, but not very far. The judges refused to see her or to hear from her, despite saying in writing, if Miss Fogarty is right, we may be wrong. Unhappily, they didn't say that to me. They said it to a member of the House of Lords while saying to me, you better put it behind you. So you'll hear from her not about her letter. You'll hear from her about the culture that I went into, a bit, I suppose, like Tigger with two wagging tails and getting it all a bit wrong, not understanding where I was. You'll hear from her about that culture. And then you'll hear from me. But you'll, at question time, you'll be able to ask all of us, if you want to, questions that may occur to you. Meanwhile, Tim. Um, maybe it's a great privilege to be asked by Geoffrey to say something, and he's a man to whom I owe an enormous debt of gratitude. So although Geoffrey thought I was going to speak in segment one about the common law, he and you will have to put up with a little bit of background material. But I promise that if you stick with me on the background material, I will eventually, the threads will all draw together and they will have relevance to the book and the drink, the book you're about to enjoy and the drinks which you will ultimately enjoy even more. In October 1977, the start of my final year at Oxford, my tutor read out to a group of us as we were about to set upon the path of getting ready for finals, two letters. The first, he said, was from a young barrister, Geoffrey Nice. And the letter read more or less as follows. If you have anybody, we were both at Keeble, wanting to be a barrister, please ask them to apply to my chambers. Life at the common law bar is interesting, and we would welcome anybody of talent whom you could send in our direction. The second letter, read out by the same tutor, 
was from a chap who'd also been to Kiel, who got a first, and whom we were told was very able. He'd completed his pupillage, but he did not get a tenancy, and his letter was more or less a diatribe about how ghastly life at the bar was. It was all a waste of time, grotesquely unfair, at the end of which the tutor said, and my advice to all of you is, don't, whatever you do, try to go to the bar. Fortunately, three of us disobeyed the instruction, I being one, and I wrote to Geoffrey. And after doing a monumentally boring commercial pupillage in a set of chambers, not currently my own, but another one, uh, I did my second six months in Farrah's building, having written to Geoffrey and having been given a pupillage. He was the first barrister I watched in court. Geoffrey Nice, I was told, is a brilliant advocate. Please go and watch him. And so I did. I went to the court. I saw this glamorous and powerful advocate making a plea in mitigation to the Billericay magistrates. <laughs> and he said how terribly sorry his client, the local supermarket, was for putting wrong pricing labels on Domestos bottles. <laughs> and I thought this glamorous barrister really was turning a pretty fine phrase in a, an area which didn't seem to me, frankly, to justify all of the effort and power of his oratory. But the advantage for me, apart from hearing powerful advocacy at the Billy Ricky Beaks, was that I was driven back by Geoffrey, for those of you who remember, in his black maigre Citroën traction, with Geoffrey asking questions about what I thought, not just about the law, but music, because we had some musical background in common, the future, and we had a very engaging conversation, all with a kind of risque glamour attached to it, as I saw. And there it was, as Geoffrey has just mentioned, two years later, in 1981, he and I worked together in, our, in my first big case at the bar, a corruption trial. Jeffrey was brought in to lead. Our client was an engineer at the National Grid power station, one of the Kent power stations, who rejoiced in the name of Brian Leslie Apps. The allegation was that he'd received favours in the form of fridges, freezers, T-bone steak dinners washed down with Guinness, parts for the yacht he was building, indeed all of the parts for the yacht he was building, from the builders who were favoured with the contracts at the power station in many millions of pounds, not just in Kent, but also Battersea Power Station, when it was then still, or well, it had been working in the 1970s. And here we get to the first part. This eventually links to the book. In a con, com, conference with Jeffrey and the client, the, the client's defense was, I went to get these fridges. It was, you know, I didn't realize I wasn't being charged for them. I never thought anything of it. Uh, and there was no corruption involved at all. It was not for favors. I just happened to get them for next to nothing, or indeed no bill ever arrived. It just so happened. And there we were in con, and Geoffrey said, why did you go to London for the fridges, the freezers, the white goods, when you live in Faversham? Pause. Client says, ah, it's because my wife particularly liked the fridge shop in London. Because Geoffrey said, fridges are fridges. You travelled 40 miles to get a fridge when you could have got one in Faversham. Ah, oh, it's because of the wife. At that point, Geoffrey says, right, we're going to have into the consultation. I couldn't quite work out why we had to have the break. And Geoffrey sent the client out and took me to one side and said, right, are we going to take a statement from the wife? And I said, well, may as well. She may corroborate him. Ah, he said, but if we do, and she comes up with the same story. And when he is cross-examined, uh, and he'll be cross-examined on the basis, you've just made this up, it never appeared in your interviews. And you've just cooked this up with, your, with the wife. I said, well, no, that's, that's, that's certainly a possibility. I hadn't, I hadn't thought of that. And he said, and suppose the wife then says, no, 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 I'm afraid my husband's lying to you. What's our position then? I said, well, I suppose in that position, we may not be able to carry on. I'm going to lose a brief. I need this brief to pay the mortgage on the flat I've just bought. And Jeffrey said, well, Suppose she's unwilling to cooperate. I said, oh my God, I can't. Suppose all of these things. Of course, this is typical Jeffrey, and you see it in the book. He was posing absolutely pertinent questions and eventually came up with the solution. 
because the first time we'd heard this story was the, from the client, where there was a real risk that we were going to become embroiled in the very things the client was going to be speaking about when he gave evidence. So Jeffrey said, a, a, an independent solicitor should speak to the wife, and all we need to know is whether she's prepared to give evidence, and if she is, the independent solicitor can take the statement. Back came the answer some weeks later, the wife is not prepared to give evidence, but our ethical position was uncompromised, as it, and it might well, we might well have led ourselves into some difficulties had Jeffrey not had the foresight to ensure that things happened independently. Well, that was 1981, and um, the client went on to have a trial with many fashionable QCs from the London bar appearing for others. But Jeffrey, at the end of the prosecution case, made a powerful submission that there was no case to answer. It was unanswerable because we had worked out, Jeffrey had, that the prosecution had charged the wrong conspiracy. There were so many potential conspirators that the prosecution hadn't identified actually that our client belonged in conspiracy A and they charged him in conspiracy C, which was fundamentally a failure in the approach to the case. The judge, Sir Donald Farquharson, newly appointed and also ex keble College, Oxford, uh, was then confronted with the prospect of a trial going belly up in circumstances where this was his first big uh, Crown Court trial. There were all sorts of defendants, huge costs. The pressures were on him to keep the trial on the road. And I'm afraid we watched as the prosecution scrabbled around to amend their indictment recharge it, they were given permission to do so, the case proceeded, and the half-time submission, which was extremely well-founded, failed. You may think it failed, because to keep the show on the road, a permission to amend was made. We then get to the closing speech. Again, powerful oratory from Jeffrey. The judge, the jury go out, and the judge, uh, sorry, the judge then does the second prosecution closing. In those days, that was possible. The prosecution could do a closing speech. The judge could himself, frankly, do a closing speech, as Joe Cantley, those of you may remember, did a defence closing speech in the Jeremy Thorpe trial. The judge, having uh, summed up for the prosecution, our client was convicted. He may have been convicted, but the judge, after Jeffrey's very powerful plea in mitigation, felt a degree of concern, and having heard a powerful story from Jeffrey about the harm this would all cause, decided to fine him the grand sum for years of corruption of £1,500. At that point, there was a wail of those whooping from the public gallery. and The judge looked up and saw our client's wife, who had not been prepared to give evidence, standing cheerfully in the brand new fur coat of many she had been wearing, which was itself part of the proceeds of his corruption, and far more valuable than the £1,500 which the judge had imposed by way of fine. The look on the judge's face as he realised that Jeffrey's advocacy had achieved, frankly, a measure of compromised justice. A man who probably should have walked, may well have been guilty, had gone down, and had got out with a very modest penalty. Well, that was 1981 to 82. Through all of that, I learnt some lessons from Jeffrey that one should always think ahead, never take for granted in the common law system in which we have been operating, the uh, status quo. I'm going to move to 1982. A young bar student uh, went, was sent to Knightsbridge Crown Court, in fact took the option to go to Knightsbridge Crown Court, because she thought that Knightsbridge Crown Court being next to Harrods was a very convenient place to watch as a bar student advocacy being performed in the Crown Court, which now has become a block of flats, but was extremely useful for those who, during the lunch adjournment, like to study jewellery. <laughs> the, the barrister in the case, which the young, uh, beautiful student was watching, was one Geoffrey Nice. And she wrote to the head of pupillage in our chambers, Michael Lure, and said, I have just seen the most powerful advocacy in Knightsbridge Crown Court, performed by the brilliant brackets, and handsome, close brackets, Geoffrey Nice. She was eventually offered a pupillage, but when she turned up, she was told, I hope Michael Lure isn't here, in this rather condescending voice, 
I don't give pretty girls to Geoffrey Nice, so you'll be having your pupillage with David Pittman. Forgive me for saying this, but David Pittman's advocacy and Geoffrey's are at diametrically opposite ends of the spectrum. The common law is full of different types of advocates who perform their functions. Sappho, having wanted to go to uh, see Geoffrey, landed with a rather more um, conventional uh, barrister. But what was the joy of this? I shared David Pittman's room. And by this means, Geoffrey has been responsible for making sure that I met my wife. And we have been married for 30 years ever since. So Geoffrey is responsible for my coming to the bar, for my meeting and marrying my wife, and for most of what has happened in terms of my thinking from those very early days of the stimulation which he gave me. Next, in the years after we had been uh, working in chambers, Geoffrey came to teach at uh, the advocacy course in Keeble. The convention at the bar was that you could not teach advocates how to be good advocates. To say that now sounds utterly ridiculous, but it was the convention that somehow you uh, learnt your trade through some process of osmosis, practice, as Geoffrey says in the book, on real clients. Think of it. Real clients go to prison. Real clients are made bankrupt if their barristers make mistakes. But until the uh, early 1990s, we simply didn't teach barristers the craft and art of advocacy. It's no different from saying that you cannot teach a violinist how to perform the violin better. It was as ludicrous as that. And Geoffrey was in the forefront of helping us to uh, fashion good teaching techniques and substantive teaching, which has enabled generations of barristers since to ensure that when they practice their art, they are doing it at least safely, if not uh, with the gifts which Geoffrey and others have. Geoffrey uh, developed a thundering common law practice, but he always asked moral questions. He never took for granted the status quo. And I think it was this aspect of Geoffrey's character which led him to the ICTY, where he embarked on huge cases, which Nana will tell you more about, its massive stresses and so on. Within the book, Geoffrey is forever, as he always has done, asking questions, and as he's done in the Gresham lectures. And the book is based around the questions which Geoffrey asks. I suggest that there are four features of the book which uh, emerge certainly from the common law, if not the whole of the book, parts of it. First, that the things we take for granted should not be taken for granted. They may mask unfairness or injustice. The examples he gives in the common law system are of politicians, judges, and prosecutors, as well as, for example, the absence of training. Second, Geoffrey is always asking, how can we do something better? At the very beginning of the book, he talks of the fact that the judges in cases like um, the Bentley case, Derek Bentley, remember, let him have it, the conspiracy to murder, where the Lord Chief Justice managed to sum up the burden and standard of proof wrongly, as was subsequently said in a judgment more than 30 years later. Geoffrey says, they all go to bed and sleep after committing these injustices happily. Why? Because they don't question the status quo. They're not acerbic enough or, sorry, they're not um, intellectually keen enough to keep asking whether they're doing the right thing. Third, Geoffrey asks in the book, I think, where does the truth lie in the processes of justice we've set up? And that question is posed in the adversarial system which I have been describing, and of course is posed within the politics and law of the international tribunals. And the fourth question, the fourth lesson not question, but the lesson that emerges, is that justice is supposed to serve all of us, whether that's within the common law jurisdictions or the uh, international or civil jurisdictions. And there's a theme which runs through the book, which is if we permit the interests of one cog in the wheel, for example, judges or prosecutors or the politicians who engineer 
the establishment of our processes to prevail or to gain some special uh, status over and above any other, we do not deliver justice because we don't deliver justice, as the book says, for all. Can I close by saying I'm extremely grateful to have been given the opportunity to make these remarks for a great deal more than seven minutes and to renew my thanks to Geoffrey. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the second sequel in, in the series Adventures of an Unorthodox British Barrister. Uh, Sir Jeffrey and my professional cooperation started some 15 years ago, and it was linked to the trial of Slobodan Milosevic, the Serbian wartime leader, who in 1999 was the first sitting president ever indicted for the war crimes and crimes against humanity at an international court. Milosevic lost his power in 2000, was arrested in 2001, and after some three months spent in Serbian jail, he was transferred to The Hague. His trial started in February 2002, a record time measured from the indictment date to the start of the proceedings compared to any other trial had certainly at the ICTY, Yugoslavia Tribunal. Sir Jeffrey was appointed principal trial attorney for the prosecution two months ahead of the trial start. It was a daunting task given the extent of the temporal and geographical scope of the indictments, but also because Sir Jeffrey had inherited three investigative teams, each dealing with one of the three geographical areas, Croatia, Bosnia, and Kosovo. And this team struggled to forge a functional cooperation as Sir Jeffrey encountered unwillingness of the teams to share information, which was made even worse by internal infighting about some very important strategic issues. So when he came to the tribunal, there was no time to lose, and under enormous time pressure, he did succeed to unite, not the trial teams, but the three different indictments to be tried in one trial, so-called joinder. On 12 February 2002, with camera lenses of the regional, national, and world media magnifying meaning of every word uttered in a courtroom, Sir Jeffrey opened the trial. He started modestly, aware of the traps of a potential over-prosecution. He used to tell us, the members of the team, that if, one under, if we understate our position, the only place we can go is up. But if we overstate our position, the only place to go is down. And throughout the trial, he remained very true to this principle of measure and sometimes understatement. In his opening speech at the beginning of the Croatian and Bosnian parts of the trial, he said, and I'm quoting his exact words, because working in an international environment where most of us are not native speakers, all native speakers always correct our English even when we think it's a style issue. So I am now quoting word by word the words of an English native speaker. And yes, Sir Jeffrey had his way with the words. He loved to talk. He was a great orator, as Tim already told us. And for non-native speakers, it was very difficult sometimes to grasp the essence. So I will test your English as well. There may be a temptation to characterize this accused simply as the sole architect. And that Temptation may have to be resisted until the precise outlines of his role are etched by evidence, because plans can emerge without a single originator. Such plans can be joined, and there can be those who choose to lead such plans. Once they join them, being criminally opportunistic and coming to be seen as, and indeed to be, central to the plan itself. 
And this may be a reality of this accused's personal history, he being a man to whom others committed to the plan, looked for leadership that he was able to provide. He took the same cautious approach to evidence. Although observing the rules of adversarial legal system adopted by most international courts, he insisted that we, the team leaders, observe religiously disclosure rules, stressing that he was not interested in conviction at any cost, but in a judgment that would stand the test of time. He also challenged the rules, or the interpretation of the rules, by judges, but sometimes also by his fellow trial attorneys. And it was very obvious, especially when it came to the rules on protection of evidence that was requested not for legitimate reason to protect someone's safety, witnesses or others, but to protect some, something called vital state interest or national state interest. And not just by Serbia, the state that was by role of Milosevic involved in a, in a crimes, but some other states. One might even say some democratic world leaders didn't want to divulge information and evidence necessary for such trials. He also fought against the right given to Milosevic to represent himself citing his Milosevic's fragile physical condition that was made worse by the workload he took upon himself when working in the court as a lawyer. Sir Jeffrey argued in numerous motions that the administration of justice should not be reduced to the right of an accused to a fair trial. He used to argue that the right of victims to see the trial finished with a judgment rendered is as important, if not more important. Um, and he did express the concern at quite early stage that Milosevic's trial might, come, might not come to a conclusion because of these components. In March 2006, when Milosevic died in his prison cell, Sir Jeffrey, like, unlike the other lawyers, did not allow for the trial record to end up in the oblivion. Because lawyers and judges often lose interest once a trial finishes without a judgment. He was also one of the very few lawyers I have worked with who understood and accepted that mass atrocity trials are not like any other criminal trials. He showed it when working with us non-lawyers. He engaged with us in political and historical explanations of ideologies uh, behind the alleged criminality of the plan, and that made him even more aware and convinced that a finished or an unfinished trial involving mass atrocities serve also as a historical record for future generation. And luckily, he was not alone among the lawyers to hold such an opinion. Late Judge Antonio Cassese wrote already in 1998 in an official tribunal's document that throughout our proceedings we strive to establish as judicial fact the full details of a madness that transpired in the former Yugoslavia. In the years and decades to come, no one will be able to deny the depths to which their brothers and sisters human beings sank and by recording the capacity for the evil in all of us, it is hoped to recognize warning signs in the future and to act with sufficient speed and determination to prevent such bloodshed. So when the Milosevic trial ended, Sir Jeffrey remained engaged in a professional and public debate about the importance 
of the unfinished trial of Milosevic, but also about more general issues concerning the future of international criminal justice. In the ongoing discussion after the end of Milosevic trial, Sir Jeffrey remained true to his legal principles, but did cross the uh, confines of uh, legal discussion. He refused to engage in any attempt for post-mortem conviction of Milosevic or any other defendant who died before the end of, um, of the trial. So at many occasions, he would raise his voice uh, against simplification of the complex processes by demonizing uh, individuals indicted of mass atrocities. Quote by Sir Jeffrey. There is no point demonizing Milosevic as the butcher of the Balkans. He held no extreme philosophical positions and simply hung on to power once it has been offered to him and he had enjoyed its taste. He operated in part through government machinery which allowed him to remain remote from the crimes being committed by Serb militias, the usual privilege of power. But he also operated secret bilateral relationships that hid from view some maybe much of what he did. <coughs> Yet by the time Milosevic died, Sir Jeffrey had already engaged in writing of the closing arguments, but not before he came here to Gresham to give his series of lectures on law did he ever, ever disclose anything he had written now almost a decade ago. Uh, he even kept the draft on his closing arguments from his fellow lawyers from the Milosevic team. And is it, this is thus not surprising that his lecture on the Milosevic trial drew a huge audience here in the hall, but also on the internet. It is, I believe, to uh, today's day, the most viewed uh, lecture by Sir Jeffrey on internet. And many details and concepts he shared uh, have been published in this book here. But as you can imagine, Milosevic trial had lasted almost four years and there is much more to be said. And let ho let's hope that this book is not the last word and certainly not the last book on the related subject. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Katrina Fogarty, and I'm a, a Jersey advocate. Um, I knew Geoffrey long before I really knew Geoffrey. He was the English judge who, in 2007, agreed to finish a Jersey trial which had been started by another off-island judge. That judge, the, the other off-island judge, had severed an indictment, tried a tenth of it, and then flounced off the case in a huff. Like all lawyers facing a judicial unknown quantity, of course I'd never met Jeffrey before, I took a very, very good look at him the first time I appeared before him, as no doubt did the lawyer acting for my client's co-accused. That co-accused was, of course, the subject of the eventual Privy Council case. Jeffrey probably didn't notice my scrutiny, but if he had done, he had absolutely nothing to fear. By the end of that short first appearance, I knew that the case was in good hands. He was firm, he was fair, and he was above all polite to counsel. This latter point is absolutely essential in any complex case where there are a number of co-accused and a number of lawyers. The tenth of the trial that had been dealt with in 2006 had been the most unpleasant experience I'd ever had in a court of law since the day I qualified. With Mr. Nice, as he then was, it was clear that there would be no tantrums, no throwing of weight about, no bullying. In short, Geoffrey, as the trial was to make plain, was indeed, and I quote, the very nice Sir Geoffrey, unquote. This became his nickname in the course of the trial between defence counsel. It was, in fact, a huge relief. 
I was so horrified after reading the Privy Council judgment of 2009 that I wrote a long letter outlining what had happened in the Royal Court and the factors which underpinned the case, some of which I touch on here, for onward provision to the Privy Council. It was obvious that that judgment could and might destroy Geoffrey. I'd been at the trial. None of the council appearing before the Privy Council had been there. As I said in that letter, had it not been for the inclusion of names, I would have thought that the judgment referred to some other case, a case that I hadn't been in, involved in. In any event, the case outlined in the judgment bore no resemblance whatsoever to the case in which I had appeared, and it has certainly shown me just how very easily any court, even a senior court, may be bamboozled. What Geoffrey did not know, and this is something that the Jersey lawyers took for granted, was that the jurisdiction had undergone very rapid and significant changes in the course of the few years prior to the trial of Peter Michel. The island has always been savage on any form of dishonesty um, by islanders towards investors. There had, however, been a rapid and hugely significant change in the island financial services uh, prior to the coming into force of the Proceeds of Crime Jersey Law on the 1st of July 1999, under which the charges in the case to be tried were framed. About this change, a, a non-local judge could simply not be expected to know. Now, as all lawyers of a certain vintage know, there was a time in the world when a jurisdiction's tax arrangements were very much its own affair. This all changed with the advent of the global economy, the expansion of the European Union, the growing concepts of tax harmonization and unfair tax advantage led to profound change in the European jurisdictions of which the UK was one. Jersey, of course, is not part of the EU, and it has a separate relationship with the EU under Protocol 3. Protocol 3 negotiated by the UK, which is responsible for Jersey's external affairs. Jersey is in fact a third country as regards fiscal harmonisation and financial services. Nevertheless, um, a certain pressure perhaps was applied to ensure a greater conformity in Jersey, as indeed in other offshore jurisdictions, both legal and moral, in the global world. The island to which I returned after a long absence in 1985 was a place where knowing your client, or KYC, in financial services jargon, effectively meant having had a long relationship with him. The lawyer had, of course, to be satisfied that his client was not involved in criminal activity, which very broadly meant guns or drugs. And if a service provider was personally confident that neither drugs nor guns underlay the financial services activity of that client, he could be satisfied and he could do what was asked of him on that client's behalf. Jersey, like other low-tax jurisdictions, did very well out of this state of affairs. Thus, the enactment of the 1999 law, which was some years in the preparation, and which made the checks to be performed before doing business with a client extremely rigorous, was a major upheaval. The change was neither welcomed nor understood by all financial services providers, such as Mr. Michel at that time, although that is, of course, not the position today. I remember my astonishment on returning to the island after a long period away, but long before the change in the law, at the £50 English banknote cash machines of the early 1980s and then 1990s, located outside and inside high street banks, seemingly on every street corner. These allowed cash to be drawn in immense sums to be handed over to or withdrawn by a financial services client with no questions asked, provided, of course, that neither guns nor drugs were involved. As I studied for the local law exams, I became aware of concepts such as the exempt company used by non-locals, which paid no Jersey taxes, provided that its activities in the island were administrative in nature, Local financial services providers usually had a plethora of foreign corporate nameplates affixed to their entrance halls and multiple telephone lines for the provision of corporate administration installed at the service provider's address. And it was to the owners of these companies that the immense cash sums could be transferred, provided, of course, there was no suspicion about drugs or guns. Now, it's very easy to see how such facilities, amongst others, 
might be used by organized criminals, including tax evaders, as indeed the evidence in the Michel case showed that they were. What is far less easy to see from the perspective of 2017 is that before the 1999 law, such things were perfectly legitimate in Jersey. The activities facilitated by the exempt company, the related international business company, and the English banknote cash machines, coupled with long professional acquaintance, uh, might be perfectly legal in Jersey, although the effects of its operation were illegal elsewhere. Broadly, it was seen as up to other jurisdictions to enforce their own laws. Of course, it may seem now like the Wild West. Well, times have most definitively changed, and for the better. In today's world, a man is deemed to be a rogue unless proven otherwise by extensive and statutory KYC. For those of you who are not lawyers, know your client. If Jeffrey, and indeed the two jurats who presided with him at the trial, and neither of whom was, uh, had a professional background in financial services, were to understand the evidence in the Michel case, they had to know about the landscape before and after the 1st of July 1999. The prosecution case was investigated very largely by English lawyers who could not be expected to know, and indeed appeared not to know, about these things and which led to the drawing of misleading, and in some cases, downright unfair prosecution, prosecution conclusions from the evidence in the case. Very fortunately, Geoffrey was mightily puzzled by some of the testimony, both written and oral. He asked for assistance, and as a lawyer educated during the relevant period, before and after the 1999 law came into force, I was in a position to help by the provision of a substantial and no doubt very boring exposition of the bones of the culture change. The evidence in the case showed that it was not just Peter Michel who failed to change his ways after the 1st of July 1999. Major high street banks and others were quite clearly doing many of the same things as Michel after the relevant date. Why was Michel prosecuted and they not? I don't know. Maybe it was because the jurisdiction did not need the small operators, but did need the major banks. Maybe the temporary transgressions of the major banks were overlooked in return for the provision of evidence against the smaller, unnecessary escape group, Peter Michel. Probably it was a policy decision. Probably it was taken in the so-called public interest. I personally have never liked policy decisions of this kind when all men and entities are supposed to be equal before the law. But that, of course, is another story. The Michel case and its consequences were undoubtedly very traumatic for Jeffrey. However, from my perspective, it enabled me to get to know him, to attend some of his lectures, including lectures at Gresham College, and to become very much better acquainted with the important work in the wider world that he's undergone during, undertaken during a lifetime as a lawyer. My admiration for his legal achievements and even more for his personal fortitude in the face of adversity is unbounded. And my former tendency to treat all judges as if they were angry hornets has been very much modified. <laughs> Being a judge is no doubt a very lonely life, but a judge is also a real person, a man of feeling and capable of great humanity. Thank you. It is hard adequately to express my gratitude to these three speakers. There are two major lessons from the Jersey case. The more important one I'll come to right at the end of remarks that I will abbreviate while I make an application to Valerie for short extension. <laughs> Granted? <laughs> Granted. <laughs> But the most obvious lesson is that this is the sort of circumstance where you will discover your friends, your true friends. It's quite an interesting experience to go into restaurants and bars and see people you know suddenly find the wall a lot more interesting than the place where you're standing. But it's even more interesting to find those people who stood by you when times were difficult. And I'm going to use this opportunity to name some of them. They're here tonight. Not all of them. Tim and Sappho 
uh, unendingly uh, supportive of me. My family, completely supportive. Nana, completely supportive. Paul Spencer, who I hope is downstairs, he had a seat reserved, wonderfully supportive. Rod Dixon in my chambers, supportive of what happened. Real friends, and Desmond Brown, who, um, uh, with Tim, helped set the needle right. There is Paul Spencer. He's in the back. He got in. He's a tough nut. <laughs> he looks after you, but he doesn't take anything for granted. A perfect sense of justice. Now let's come, come back to the subject matter of the lectures, to some of the things we've heard, and a few conclusions and perhaps time for a few questions. Overall, um, no, let, let me approach it in another way. There are some conclusions, but before I come to those conclusions, my travelling in three different landscapes was only part of the, the late onset broadening of my experience. Tim's wife, Sappho Dias, herself a leading lawyer in her own field and from Burma, had already expanded my interest. When years ago, she got asked, me and various other people, to be involved in Burma and in the human rights abuses being committed in Burma, long before the fashion of the last year or so to raise it in the popular press. Decades of reporting on Burma had gone on. And so she got me to be involved, and I started to do the little bit I could while she was doing very important work in taking cases to United Nations committees. From that, I spread my wings a bit and got involved in North Korea, the two people who helped me particularly with that, Ben Rogers, the chap who was, do you remember, sent back from Hong Kong week before last, and uh, David Alton in the House of Lords, neither of them can be here. But they got me involved in North Korea. This room is a result of that, that we were able to launch in England the report of uh, Kirby, Michael Kirby, the Australian judge, who gave a damning report years ago now, three or four years ago now, on the human rights abuses in North Korea and recommended that the case be sent to the International Criminal Court. Then there was Hamid Sabi, who got me involved, he's sitting down there, who got me involved in looking at the, with others, at the problems of Iran in the 1980s, where there had been wild atrocities by the regime of the Ayatollahs, um, thousands killed in horrible circumstances. Why do I tell you about these three different examples of unhappy events around the world? It's because of the first conclusion, the first unhappy conclusion, that working in this kind of law brings me to, and brings other people to as well. And it is that where other interests involved are involved, the interests of the victim will always be at the bottom of the pile. The victims in Burma. For a time, Sappho was able to get ministries in London and I suppose around the world to say what a good idea it would be to take this case to the International Criminal Court. And then Anne San Suu Kyi was released from house arrest and the place became a nice holiday destination and it's good for business, and so no longer a good idea. Did they think when they said it wasn't a good idea about the victims? And the victims who would not learn, as they might do through a judicial process, of what had actually happened. The same in North Korea. Justice Kirby's report, launched in this room, is the strongest report you can imagine. Recommends that the regime of North Korea be referred to the International Criminal Court. How far did it get? It actually got as far as the General Assembly, but not to the critical um, Security Council. It's presently on a shelf. And of course, a different kind of problem, but similar in, in one respect. The uh, diaspora of Ir Iran, who put on with uh, Hamid Sabi's uh, uh, assistance an informal tribunal to leave a record of the terrible things that happened in the 1980s, they would never have satisfaction from an official body because no official body would dare 
to investigate uh, Iran publicly. In all cases, there may be some good reasons. There may be good, what is it, geopolitical reasons for not dealing with these things in a formal way. But the result of that is that the interests of the victims, the real victims, are overlooked. And in the lectures, I dealt with the one connected example of victims' interests being overlooked in the various cases at the ICTY that dealt with Srebrenica, the terrible massacre of 8,000-plus men and boys in July of 1995. And I revealed, I hope, to those of you who were here how evidence was either blacked out from public view or, so far as intercepts were concerned, kept away altogether from the court. And it's important for us to remember for Srebrenica that the West waved Srebrenica through. I was shocked myself to see a Newsnight um, program of 2009, I think, where Holbrook, um, the president's man, Clinton's man, uh, negotiating everything that there was to negotiate in the Balkans, face to camera, says, I was instructed to abandon Srebrenica, Zepa, and Garajda. Somebody wrote to him and said, when you said abandon, did you mean the territory or the territory and the people? And he wrote back by email, both. On the same program, I was shocked not to have remembered the Dutch uh, defense minister, Verhoeven, saying two members of the permanent five of the Security Council knew in advance of the attack, asked the question, which two, he says, I am forbidden from telling you. Now, again, whose interests are involved here? in international justice mechanisms or in possible international justice mechanisms that don't work, the victims. Because it is they who want to know by some formal process what happened. And if you keep away from a court the evidence of what the two principal defendants in the um, Srebrenica example, because they, the intercepts were between Mladic and Milosevic at exactly the time as for Venice, if you keep that information out of the public domain, who are you harming? Are you harming the great players who thought, well, it would be a good idea to suppress this evidence because it shows how badly involved the West was? Not really. But you are harming the people who are, of course, coming to the end of their lives in a natural way, who do not have access to the truth. And did we not see another example of it last week? With HMS Sheffield. Here was a report of our own government that showed the truth of what happened and that will have been wanted by the people whose relations and friends died on that vessel. But it was kept from them because it would have upset the euphoria the post-Falklands euphoria. As you think about these issues, if you do, think of what actually must have happened. Some maybe mid-level diplomat of one country or another or two saying, well, I don't think it's a good idea to reveal that evidence, do you? No, I don't. I think it's better suppressed. Quite right. Do you think that their conversation included. But if we do that, we will be harming the interests of the people most affected. I fear not. Two other quick connected points, and then I'll end. The next connected point, which has come from my looking at all, not looking at all, but looking at various conflicts and various legal systems. And you can think this is idealistic, schoolboy-like, if you like, is that there was no, there is no public culture of confession. 
in, as far as I can see, in any country. All our governments, especially our adversarial one, which is good for television, but I'm not sure how good it is for government, work on the basis that people will lie to one another and hide truths. And they, they won't reveal the truths to the public. I heard that MP who I sometimes like, Kenneth Clark, saying, never admit a thing. Why not? And it is a huge and unforgivable hypocrisy. Why? Because the ordinary person, you or me, in the dock of the magistrate's court or the crown court facing a, convict, uh, facing a trial of any kind, are expected to confess. We get benefit from confession, but it is sort of expected that you will tell the truth. And yet there are no state organs that see it as their duty to reveal the truth unless they are really forced to it. And I think recently in the Brexit, I don't want to talk about Brexit, uh, but I think recently there was, was it a letter from 125 MPs asking for, for revelation of the documents that exist in government showing the actual consequences for the country of, of Brexit. They won't be made available necessarily. All round we have no policy, no, no culture really of telling the truth and we should do. And connected to that I suppose in a curious way, is the second lesson from Jersey, but a pretty obvious lesson, which is that whenever there is a state institution whose interests may be engaged, then your interests or the interests of smaller, less powerful people will count for nothing. And so I'm going to end, but with that concept in mind, offering a corrective. In all areas of the legal profession that I've experienced here and overseas, there are many extremely good lawyers, well-disposed, professional, honest, and true. And indeed, I suspect, no, I won't say that, but it's only the minority of occasions when the process is get corrupted to the limited extent they do. And I hope that in the lectures I gave and also in the book, if you read it, there is a balance between, as Tim in his analysis of the book, saying that things were not to be taken at face value, there is a balance between that and recognising the huge good that lawyers can and do do, do in society, but like everything else, you have to be on guard for what you see. And, and this business of not being able to trust anyone, which is, in a sense, or any standard, which is something Tim picked up from the opening part of the book that dealt with how, say, people will do things thinking they've done right, because they're acting according to standards that are now passed. With that idea in mind, he referred to the judge in the Bentley case. I'll give you some, a short passage that explains why I wrote the book. But before I do, I'm looking around. I'm not sure, did I mention Rod Dixon earlier on? I did, but what I didn't mention in relation to one matter, the Jersey matter, was, was Graham Williams whose wife, Anna Worrell, is here. And, and this is a little touch that I really must mention. Graham didn't know me especially well, um, but we were sort of vaguely associated. And he wrote a little book called The Book of Bad Judges, a short book of bad judges. Uh, <laughs> and he mentioned me in it in a very carefully crafted introduction. But, but if you read it, it wasn't I who was the bad judging. That was elsewhere, and I'm very grateful to him and to Anna for helping me out in that respect. Um, I hope I haven't missed anybody else to whom I should have been referring. The Bonhamis, immense supporters of me 
throughout my life since they first encountered me. And if I have, please forgive me. But I'll tell you how and why I wrote this book in a way from the last lines, lines of the epilogue. And I'll just read you half a page. It refers uh, to a man called Tom Early, who was the communist, Marxist, conscientious objector, Vietnam demonstrator, teacher. Surprisingly engaged at my ultimately respectable public, well, day, day public school or whatever it was. And he was also a Welsh poet. And his daughter Jean is here because I became friends of their entire family uh, to represent him, Tom being dead. And this is how I'll end my presentation. Calibrating personal goodness in the course of aging is to add one task to an already difficult battle. Growing old is probably the greatest battle many will face, not least, because the outcome is certain and victory or defeat will be assessed only by how defeat is handled. Many, perhaps most, of us who have spent some of life wondering how we have contributed, approach the end of a conveyor belt that is going to tip us over a cliff into an unknown emptiness, unable properly to assess what we have achieved, but already beyond use to the society of which we were a part. The last two verses of Tom Early's poem, Rebel's Progress, about his life from Marxist to anti-Vietnam war demonstrator, sets out how his activist's political journey would end. So now I'll leave the politics to others and not be an outsider anymore. I'll go back to the valley, to my mother's, and never set my foot outside the door, except to go to chapel on Brinsayan and maybe join the Kumbach male voice choir. I'll sit at home and watch the television and talk about the rugby by the fire. No Welsh valley or talking about the rugby for me, as it happens, but surrender of a lifetime of thinking constructively about world affairs to little more than reminiscing about cosy times past. Is this what aging, lemming gangs of skilled surgeons, school crossing keepers, scientists, judges, street cleaners and astronauts all face, knowing the cliff is near? leaving some record little better than a message in a bottle thrown into the sea before this particular lemming falls. Maybe a better thing to do.